I'd like to welcome everybody to the Pardee Center. Uh, it's uh, our pleasure to, uh, to host this event. Uh, the South Asia uh, 2060 um, actually be began as a Pardee Center event, uh, as part of a series of books that start to envision what regional futures in different parts of the world might actually look like, and to explore those, uh, those potential futures from social, cultural, economic, political, um, and governance standpoints. And so this, is a, uh, this, this particular volume uh, has been in the works for four years. Uh, and so we are um, extremely fortunate to have both Adel, who, who conceived of this series of uh, uh, books and events, um, as the former director of the center. Um, so we're very pleased and honored to have you and your co-authors here uh, to, discuss the, to discuss the book with us. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be back here. It, it literally really is. It's a great pleasure to be back in Boston, to be back at Boston University, and most important, to be back at Boston University. Let me also take this opportunity to more formally welcome Tony uh, to the Boston uh, University community and to thank him for hosting uh, and the Party Center for hosting this. As uh, Tony pointed out, this has been a... Uh, a, a work of passion in many ways. It's part of a series of things that the Party Center produced, the first of which was on China, uh, looking at the future of democracy in China. Joe Few Smith led that, a conference and then a book. Uh, we did one on Africa, uh, and the one on Africa was done by a uh, set of postdocs here at the center, uh, resulted in a set of journal articles as well as a report called The Good News from Africa. We did a publication then on Latin America 2060, and South Asia 2060 is the next part of that, if you will. I will take just a few minutes to go through this, because as you will look at, um, find out, it's sort of a difficult project to tell you everything about, because there isn't really a thing to tell you about. We have 47 authors from all parts of uh, South Asia and from beyond. Uh, this was structured as a set of uh, conference panels that were held at various points, one in Singapore, one here in Boston at Tufts, uh, one in Pakistan, uh, mm -hmm. one here uh, at the center. And as I said, 47 authors looking at just about all things South Asian. And when I say all things South Asian, you know, you have the names of the authors flashing up. And this really is a who's who, including some of my colleagues who are here who work on, on South Asia. So we have Malia Lodi, Pakistan's former ambassador to the US. Uh, we have Ambassador Hilary Sinet. Uh, we have uh, Laba Chering, who was who's from Bhutan. Uh, we have um, Rajan Gupta. We have, I won't go through all the names, but essentially people in all fields that we could think of. And the fields are varied. They vary from a lot on politics, a lot on geopolitics, do a lot on development, on water, on energy, on urbanization, on demography, uh, but all sorts of other things on the media. What is happening with the changing media? Uh, what is happening on water uh, conflicts? What is happening, my, one of my favorite topics, on cricket? <laughs> and why cricket may actually be, that's actually really is. Saad Chef Kathir has a fascinating chapter on cricket, doesn't tell you who will win. <laughs> <laughs> right, but does tell you what it does to the South Asian ethos. Uh, we have uh, chapters on culture, on art, on literature, on poetry. Uh, and essentially the question we asked was a fairly simple one and therefore a really difficult one. And the question was when you think of South Asia as a region, not as particular countries, but as a region, what are the trends you see today leaving a shadow on tomorrow? And that's a very, very interesting question because this is a region which in many ways is more regional than many other regions in terms of language, in terms of the movies we watch, the music we listen to, the history we've had, the colonization we've gone through. So there's far more that is common in this region than in many other regions. And yet in politics, in sociology, in anthropology, uh, we do not act as much as a region, as many other regions do. So the conundrum, the question was, is South Asia as a region, does that make sense? And if we take the long view, 
and 2060 for all of these was you know about 50 years from now that's long enough that you can think of if you think of in grandparent terms and yet short enough that you can actually consider the shadow of today on 50 years from now so that was really the thing and sort of we did this encyclopedic if you will but what we did here and as i said by overview i won't go into the details but we tried to find the best people working on those issues and then we said to them don't give us the long drawn out scholarly paper give us the essence of all that you have learned and go out on a limb and write us a short think piece if you will on what you see those trends being and the result i think are fascinating as i said uh, in these in these 47 authors a lot of things come they don't agree on everything they are from all over the region about a third of them are actually from outside the region uh, from <coughs> europe from uh, the us uh, but we distilled in our introductory chapter uh, five grand propositions if you will uh, and i think sort of they sound simplistic but they're really not uh, these are not propositions that all the authors agree on, but we thought that in the reading of all of them together, they stand out as themes that are of particular importance. So I will very just sort of read the headlines on those five big propositions, the five uh, lessons that we learn about South Asia. And the first is that the idea of South Asia is strong, even as the structures of South Asianness are not. This to me was the biggest surprise. I don't know if it was to my co-editor uh, Moid Yusuf here. I thought some of the authors would say South Asia doesn't make sense. I thought some of the authors would say even if it does make sense today it won't make sense tomorrow. I thought at least someone would say look here India is going to go out of orbit and the other will fall apart. I thought someone would say look at this region Pakistan, Afghanistan, go to a psychiatrist. You know, nothing is holding you guys together. It wasn't really like that. We had our critics. We had people who were taking a very hard sort of look at South Asianness. But there was a grand desire to think, conceive of South Asia as South Asia. Even from the people that I thought would challenge that notion much, much, much more. One of our authors, Kanakma Nick Dixit, uh, talks about South Asia and says it should be one word. There isn't a space between the two, right? And he has a very fascinating take on that. He said that's where we are not. This is a geographic concept, not a political concept until you put those two things together. But this was one of the big lessons that the idea of wanting a South Asia is a very, very strong idea, but the structures of holding on to a South Asia are not. The second proposition that comes through from a reading of this is that competitiveness, not cooperation, defines South Asian institutions. The first part of this is not a surprise. It is a very competitive reason. It, has a re it is a region which has a history fraught of wars amongst itself, of tensions amongst itself. But the second part I think is particularly important that it defines not just the history but the institutions. And this is not to just simply to say that the institutions in some way manage the competitiveness, whether it is SARC, the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, in some ways they manage the historical competitiveness, in other ways they are a manifestation of the same. And you see this when you read the chapters on trade, and why that doesn't flow, you see this on chapters on um, water, for example. That these institutions become the arena of that competitiveness, which to me is not that bad, you know, better, better argue over a table than across guns. Uh, but, but that, and there's more to that, but I won't go into that. The third proposition that seemed to strike us was that the South Asian state is generally overbearing and has mostly fallen short of expectations of ordinary South Asians. It is very interesting, you know, those of us who teach international relations or political science, we have to sort of explain to students the difference between state and government. You don't need to explain that to anyone in South Asia. They understand state, and they understand it, I think, mostly as a negative thing. Uh, part of this is a legacy of colonization, 
of the state being an extractive state and so on and so forth. Part of it is the continuing tension between state and citizen, where the state from our reading of these chapters is generally seen as overbearing and having fallen short of the grand expectations uh, that the region had of itself. The fourth uh, of our findings is that security and development are seen as key, but are still seen as competing challenges across South Asia. It's, it's very, very interesting. Chapter after chapter after chapter would say they should not be seen as competing. Chapter after chapter after chapter would talk of the two as if they are competing. Even the narrative of they shouldn't compete, that security and development are not choices. You don't have one kilo of this and therefore one kilo less of that. Even though that aspiration is there, people understand that development is a security challenge in this region. And security is a development challenge in this region. The tension between the two is also very clear. And the fifth and the final of our propositions was that the hope for the future of South Asian-ness, note that I have now brought the two together, uh, the hope for the future of South Asian-ness stems more from the South Asian citizen than from the South Asian state. Chapter after chapter after chapter, if they infest, invest in a vernacular of hope, it is hope in the citizen. Now that citizen may be talking about the media, that citizen may be talking about the cricket, uh, that citizen may be talking about civil society and NGOs and development organizations, but it seems that our authors as a whole invest far more faith in the ability of the citizen to force, society to force the state, then the state to lead society along. So those are, again, very, very briefly and very, very quickly, um, some of the big sort of lessons that come. We will move now to a panel. We have three of the authors here. Unfortunately, um, uh, Balakrishna Raja Gopal uh, could not join us. He's just returned from India and unfortunately is not well. But we have three of our authors here. Before I invite them up and uh, welcome them into the conversation, uh, let me just say, as I said, this is a lot of people who made this happen. And uh, first, uh, to acknowledge that, unfortunately, on the way we lost two of our authors uh, who died untimely deaths. Uh, one was Jalal Alamgir uh, from Bangladesh, professor here in Boston. And the other was Ambassador Hillary Sinnott, uh, who also uh, 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 left us, hopefully, uh, but, but the chapters are in the book, uh, and, and very much sort of make it a better volume. So we have dedicated this uh, to them. I would also like to thank lots of people, won't go through all the names, certainly the staff here at the Party Center, um, Cynthia, who is here, Teresa, who's not here today, uh, but a whole string of some excellent uh, graduate students. Uh, Faris Islam here in Boston, Jennifer Mitchell helping me in Islamabad, it's kind of interesting, an American student who was helping in Pakistan and a Pakistani student who was helping in Boston. Uh, that too is the reality of South Asia. <laughs> Uh, and Emmet uh, Telugu, who is uh, not here right now, but without whom this could absolutely not have happened, uh, who was a graduate fellow here at the Party Center now on the West Coast. So with a thanks to them, with thanks to all of you, if I can ask my three colleagues, my colleague uh, Moid Yusuf, who is directing the uh, South Asia program at the uh, US Institute of Peace now, was a research fellow here at the Party Center, co-edited the book, Shala Hairi, our own professor here from Boston University, and Bina Sarver, a friend, journalist, and Twitterer at large, please. Thank you again, for all three, for, for joining us, uh, Moit, Shala, Bina. Uh, let me start with Moit. Uh, and what we've asked them to do is to maybe start us off with a few very brief comments on how they see South Asia in the areas that they wrote about. Uh, on, um, in, uh, on the political side, on the development side, on the civil society media side. Uh, and then we will flow into a conversation with all of you and our panel. Moit. Thank you. Um, and let me add my thanks to, to the party center uh, who allowed this and made this, this book possible. And it's, it's a pleasure to be back here. Um, so I'm stuck with talking about what all the authors said is the problem. Um, the state of South Asia um, and the politics and, and, and security around that. Um, 
so I think I'll kick off with a depressing thought, uh, or, or a bunch of them, and then let, let others bring some optimism into the discussion. What I'll do is talk through some of what we see in the book, um, and just pepper that with, with some of my own comments. But essentially, if you look at South Asia, and if you look at the, the gist of the chapters um, in the book on, on the subject of the state, the politics, the security, um, essentially, that is the overbearing truth of South Asia. Uh, you can't get away from the state if you talk about South Asia. And much of what um, is, is seen to be um, the state is negative, as, as Professor Najam uh, mentioned. Um, the book has a whole section on, on these topics. We've looked at democracy, we've looked at conflict, reconciliation, religion, terrorism, uh, nuclear rivalry. Uh, specifically India, Pakistan, um, South Asian institutions, um, China's role and linkage with, with South Asia, etc. And some of the interesting observations that come out, um, one is on the drivers. What is it that's going to actually drive South Asia's future? And, and I'll use um, the five drivers that are identified by one of the chapters by Professor Amitabh Mattu from India. Um, and he talks about demography, uh, democracy and devolution, dialogue, development, and diversity. He likes his Ds. <laughs> he likes, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think I think it, these were the five Ds that he that, that he pointed to. But it's a good summation of much of what you read in the book and in my own experience as we look at the future of South Asia, how these five play out and interact with each other. Uh, perhaps would give you a very good sense of where South Asian security politics. Um, and this beast called the state uh, is going to, going to end up. Um, and I'll very quickly touch, touch on some of these. But one of the ones that I think overall is being seen as a positive now in South Asia by South Asian um, experts and also by authors of our book is the point about democracy. Um, you know, institutions moving in a direction where you've got um, at least elections becoming the norm. Uh, transitions to democracy taking place. Pakistan just went through its much hyped uh, transition. Afghanistan has one um, coming up and then other countries are perhaps slightly ahead of the curve. Um, the point to make on this is actually, and, and that's a distinction perhaps that the book doesn't make too well in, in the chapters. And I'm one of those who've always seen democracy and electocracy, if you will. Uh, the conduct of elections as two very different things. Um, and I think the, the popular argument here is that you have elections as a transition to democracy. Well, you have elections, but that doesn't say much about inclusion uh, of people in the system. And I think the point to be made for the future of South Asia, and that is one that the book makes very clearly, is that if you have exclusive growth and you leave majority of people out of the future of South Asia, you are going to have good trends, i.e. democracy, i.e. development, actually produce bad results. Uh, and so just going through the motions of certain things is not enough, and I think democracy is a good example of that. Not to say that that shouldn't happen, but I think we need to strive for more. Um, on the demography, um, I think it's universal. It's not only this book, but no matter where you look, um, youth is the future of South Asia. Uh, partly, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer because countries like India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, um, Afghanistan have young populations. There are youth bulges in all of these countries. Um, some, of the, some of the most bloated youth populations are in this region. And every time you talk about this, there's also this, this idea of hope from the next generation. Partly because, uh, may I say, the elder generation has messed up big time. Um, <laughs> Uh, but just to make you guys happy, uh, I will, and this is a topic I've personally worked on a lot. I'm one of the skeptics when it comes to this idea of the next generation bringing uh, positive change in South Asia. Um, and and my, my friends in the social media really don't like this when I say this, but, but we've, with due apologies, I, I, I think we've created an artificial South Asia of people who, who Facebook and, and use Twitter and do whatever. And there's a parallel reality to the real South Asia, which is being generated through this process. Um, in reality, the average South Asian is not that hopeful. Um, 
And the youth of South Asia have been socialized in a system which is pervasively corrupt and where rule of law is not prized, uh, which is much different than the generation you grew up in or our parents uh, grew up in, where I think you, you had a clear distinction between right and wrong and then made a choice of which direction you want to go in. But now the rules of the game in South Asia themselves have become perverse enough. Uh, and you're seeing a lot of youth come into parliaments, into democratic processes, which is great. But you're also seeing that it can easily go wrong in a number of cases, where they're basically just following the footsteps of whatever the rules of the game are. Um, uh, true to form, I've been told by my mentor that I have two minutes to shut up. Um, in terms of politics, security, and conflict, which is another theme, and that's the last theme I'll touch upon, um, there you've got a few elephants in the room which come out in the book, religion being one major one, and how South Asian states deal with religion, and how political elite use religion to their advantage uh, will be a major determinant of where conflict goes in South Asia. But this again ties into how inclusive your process of growth and democracy and, and institutions is. Um, Ambassador Bill Milam, who writes one of the chapters in this book, uh, talks about terrorism uh, flowing out of um, sort of a process where you're excluding a number of your, or your people um, and talks about terrorism as having no boundaries. And so if religious conflict spills into terrorism, which is the case today in Pakistan, Afghanistan, much uh, has been in India and uh, other countries, then I think you've got a South Asia-wide conflict problem, which you won't be able to distinguish nearly as well as you have been in the past 20 or 30 or 40 years. Uh, and so, so the bottom line really comes down to how inclusive your process of forward movement as South Asia is going to be, um, whether it's in terms of religion, in terms of democracy, in terms of institutions. Um, the final uh, thought is that there are two overbearing facts that come out in the book and I fully uh, subscribe to. The first one is South Asia, unfortunately, is India and Pakistan plus the rest. Mm -hmm. These are the two countries who've held South Asia hostage for 65 years. And it's only these two countries that will allow it to get to an all boats rising kind of scenario where they, their normalization will be a, a, a spillover effect going throughout South Asia. But unfortunately, they've just been too hegemonic and too negative and competitive in their relationship to allow that. So, so you can't get away from that fact, even though we talk about South Asia as a region, I think the onus is on these two countries to start moving the process better. And I'll leave you... Um, with two quotes, which is my last observation of the two that I mentioned, and that is, if there's one thing that comes out of this section in the book of what may actually move South Asia in the right direction in terms of politics and security, it's leadership. Um, there's, a, there's a cry across the board to say that the leadership has failed um, South Asian citizens, and that's where the finding comes from saying that the citizen is, we put much more hope in the citizen than in the state. And from um, Professor Matu's chapter, uh, one of the things he says, and this should tell you that we really need to change gears in South Asia if we've got to move forward, says only a determined leadership displaying extraordinary foresight, creativity, and imagination, and radically departing from the policies of the past can change the course of the region's future. So it's, it's really a directional change that we are looking for, not more of the same. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you for that positive <laughs> prognosis, Moid. And, and the leadership point is a particularly important one if you've just been scanning the headlines this week. Uh, a leadership crisis, continuing leadership crisis in Pakistan. Uh, an election in India that is fraught with discussions of what leadership is and where it comes from, whether it comes... From, from the family line or whether it comes from religious grounds and so on and so forth. Bangladesh in its own throes of the leadership crisis. Nepal just held a uh, Commonwealth summit where part of the issue was the legitimacy, if you will, of some of the leadership uh, activities, actions there. So you see this across, uh, Nepal just had uh, an election. Uh, so all of this you see happening in South Asia right now. But let us move right along to Shala, uh, who uh, wrote along with uh, Brenda. And we have other authors actually in the audience, uh, Professor Hasnath, uh, Brenda, and uh, Shala co-wrote the chapter on gender and development. 
Thank you very much, Abel. Thank you, Moi. Thank you all for coming. Yes, this paper was written with my um, wonderful friend, Dr. Brenda Maxwaney. And I have to say that although Iran was not included in the list, uh, I feel like an honorary uh, Pakistani citizen with my good friend from India. So I feel I have a bit of a legitimacy to say something about South Asia. Uh, well, uh, Brenda and I have written this article together, so I'm going to refer to us as we, but that's not a royal we. You understand <laughs> that it is me and Brenda together. Um, we are actually, now having listened to you both, are humbled by the enormity of the intractable problems facing South Asia. We think that we need to change the meta-narrative of restrictive women due to their nature. It is not their nature that has kept them underdeveloped, but rather the weight of the political and cultural dominance and religious ideology, which account for many of the social ills in the region of which gender discrimination is the most debilitating examples. So we dream, we think, that unless women are seen as fully human, as partners rather than adversaries, and are here by men in power, little, little will change. Women's energies and talents are wasted unless invested in the development of themselves their families and society. So we have <coughs> thought of some challenges, some solutions, and there to dream <coughs> something, which I'm going to be talking in a bullet form. So as for challenges, we thought about women have little or no mobility. <coughs> the most important thing is women have no mobility. They cannot appear for the most part in public domain, nor can they be active in political activities. They are discriminate, discriminatory marriage, divorce laws, and family laws, which really binds them uh, forever to on uh, favorable situations. They have little legislative power and minimal part in decision making. They have little or no economic independence, even though they contribute to the household's livelihoods enormously, particularly in rural areas. There's abysmal educational opportunities. Of course, there are various races that exist for South Asian societies, but they are low on the whole and most poor um, rates of literacy in Afghanistan and Bhutan. Now, on the other hand, there's a huge dispa disparity between the role and position of women who become leaders in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in India. South Asia has an abundance of women leaders. At the same time, the mass of women, the uh, population, lives in abject poverty and dependence. Now, we thought of some solutions. Of course, m so much of it is, uh, is, uh, were said here. We, we think the most important thing are women's economic and political empowerments. And that will come about when we we can think of or create or move towards creating an egalitarian society by encouraging and supporting civil society in South Asia, which was again mentioned here. And there are some hopeful signs of civil society uh, started by women and uh, pushed forward. In fact, Bina has been in involved in some of them. We think that women should have uh, you know, political voice. There should be a space made for women to have political voice. And of course, legal equality and gender justice. Now, let's, let me say a few words about our dream and how we dare to dream about South Asia. We have intent identified the deep-rooted culture of patriarchy as part of the big challenge. At the same time, we would like to stress that patriarchy is not an unchanging monolith. We believe that there are benevolent aspects of patriarchy that need to be tapped into and highlighted. We are referring to what we have called paradox of patriarchy. That is to say, rethinking the gender relationship within the context of the women's development and empowerment in South Asia, we believe that father-daughter axis has the potential to be utilized towards legitimating women's mobility and public activity, to initiate massive social transformations and change, and to help achieve gender justice. 
It is the prospects for gender collaborations and male caring. We like to underline this whole idea of male caring that needs to be tapped into and actively employed to explore approaches to gender equality. In mending abusive gender relations and in eliminating gender violence in South Asia and, and indeed in much of the world. We believe that South Asian men, much like men globally, have the potential to embrace the collective benefits of caring and partnership that are essential for the well-being of their families and their society. That women's gain is not and will not the men's loss. We imagine a future for so uh, South Asia, if we may be allowed to have some imaginative thinking, that has genuinely eradicated gender discrimination by engendering local govern governance bodies like panchayats and uh, jirgas. That is to say, these institutions can be reformatted, rethought of, and reused as uh, self-governing, uh, power-sharing institutions at local and community level. We also envisage advising, uh, devising a policy shift at the regional level, borrowing from successful gender equality strategies used in other regions of the world. Lastly, we think that SARC political leadership should actively focus on gender equality and on women's mobility and empowerment across the region, as the Nordic countries have done through the Nordic Council and Nordic Council of Ministers. We then anticipate that our ambitious dream of South Asia region, free of gender discrimination and a culture of dominance, may actually come closer to reality. Thank you, Shala. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll come back to our colleagues for questions. And I already have one brewing in my mind. But before that, Bina Sarva, who apart from many other things, manages uh, a very interesting journalistic partnership between the largest newspaper in India and the largest newspaper in Pakistan called Aman Ki Asha. So that would be hope for peace, uh, at trying to create a new narrative journalistically of, uh, of coexistence. Pina. Thank you, Adil. And hello, everybody. It's really good to be here at the party center this beautiful cold day. Um, as Adil said, I work with Aman Ki Asha, which is the hope for peace between India and Pakistan. And I have to let you to mention here that actually Aman Ki Asha has a South Asian vision. It is about India and Pakistan, but with the realization that because, as Moit pointed out, the India-Pakistan relations bedevil the entire region, no SARC, uh, you know, SARC is not able to move forward because at every SARC meeting there's a, uh, a fight between, uh, you know, tensions between India and Pakistan. And, uh, you know, so Aman Ki Asha actually uh, has a vision for regional development and regional well-being and, South and, a, and a South Asian vision. Um, so that actually is, is, my, is the first point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make was that, um, you know, I think that, uh, I think Moit uh, put it very well that, that, uh, the, that the people, that there's much more faith in the people than in the governments. And I think that the people of South Asia and particularly of India and Pakistan with relation to India-Pakistan relations are far ahead of their governments in how they see each other because these are two countries where you know everybody thinks outside the outside world looking outside will look at them and think that these are two countries that are enemies practically enemies almost at on the verge of war all the time there's constantly cross-border firing at the line of control and all of that and yet, when the people of India and Pakistan meet, it is, I, I have never come across the people of India and Pakistan meeting in any situation as enemies. It's always as long lost friends, it's as, it's, there's curiosity, there is a desire to know each other um, in, in international seminars. I mean, there's a story about um, when, when Fares Ahmed Fares got the Lenin Peace Prize, and I think um, the Indian poet, um, uh, Ali Sardar Jafri, I think, he got the Lenin Peace Prize at the same time. And uh, they had this uh, situation in Moscow where there was this big lunch and there was tension because pe they thought this was in the, this was in 62, I think, 62 or 63. 
And so before Ali Sardar Jafri and Faiz Ahmed Faiz came into the room, there was tension that an Indian and a Pakistani are going to come in and how will they meet each other. And they were seated at the opposite ends of the room. And as they came in to the room, the sort of hush fell. And these two men walked towards each other and the tension grew and they embraced each other as long lost friends, which they were. And that is still the case. And you know, you're talking about the South Asian, South Asia region and how um, all your authors, everybody, uh, uh, you know, uh, went forward, you know, went ahead with or went with the South Asian vision. And that really is the case. I mean, at, when I was uh, at, the, at the Neiman Foundation at Harvard uh, two years ago, one of the fellows was from Pakistan, from North Waziristan, and a fellow from India, from Kerala. Now, geographically, linguistically, food wise, there is nothing in common between North Waziristan and Kerala at the tip of India. And yet these two were the best of friends. They, they had a bond, and, a, and, and I think that comes from that South Asian-ness, that South Asian identity. Um, so um, I, I think that, again, taking the theme of the people forward, that what, ha what has really helped the people and what is really, I think, going to push the governments to act is the uh, as I've meant and I've talked about it in my chapter, sort of the marriage of these consumer tools, these smartphones with the internet, um, the, 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 how Skype, YouTube, um, you know, your, your cameras on your smartphones, your video cameras on your start smartphones, your being now the ability to WhatsApp and Viber and all, all these connecti connectivity devices and just in a way really pulling people together. And yes, perhaps I agree that it is limited to those who have that connectivity, but it's growing so fast. And people who don't have connectivity all the time have it some of the time. They'll go to internet cafes, they'll go to cyber cafes, they'll borrow their friends' phones, they'll <coughs> connect. And so you have uh, a, a lot of people um, you know, connecting, like for example, uh, the um, Twitter, for example, you know, you can say that people call it an echo chamber, that you kind of follow the people who you, whose views you agree with, or you talk to, the, you know, you reply to the people you, whose views you like, and, and you block the people you don't like, and all of that, and that goes for Facebook also. But because, say I'm talking about Twitter, because as Adil said, I'm, a, I'm, an, avid, I'm an avid Twitterer, <laughs> uh, that it is still a public forum. Unless you have a limited profile, it's a public forum. And on that public forum, people come across views that they may not have come across. And so I know, of, I know personally of, I don't know, dozens of Indians and Pakistanis who connected on Twitter or via Facebook and who had not had that, uh, and whose views of the other country, of the other side, were completely undermined uh, by that connection and, and realization of uh, all the commonalities. And uh, that, that goes, uh, that is also true for uh, you know, Nepal, Bangladesh, um, Sri Lanka. And there, there, is, there is a South Asian vision, and people have been talking about a South Asian Union, or a South Asian Confederation, or a South Asian Federation, an idea that I heard for the first time maybe 15 or 20 years ago from Dr. Mubashir Hassan in Lahore, um, who is one of the founders of the Pakistan People, Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. And the PIPFPD, uh, which was started in 1993 or 90, 94, um, again, PIPFPD came out of South Asia meetings because there would be South Asian meetings, you know, with the formation of SARC in the 80s. There was a, suddenly a lot of South Asia going on, and there were these South Asia meetings in Nepal or in Sri Lanka or usually in a third, another country because you couldn't get visas. India, Pakistan often don't get visas to visit each other's countries. And, but at these meetings, again, the India-Pakistan issue would take so much precedence. And a lot of the Indians and Pakistanis who met at these South Asian meetings then formed bilateral connections. And the Pakistan-India People's Forum was one of those. And that, that led to many more um, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, sectoral meetings like of journalists and of um, students, dentists. There was one time I remember I was going for an Indian visa and the counselor said to me, I hope you don't get a tooth problem this week because all your dentists are in India for a, for a conference. Um, so, um, and I think that Aman Ki Asha has created a groundswell uh, that has, a, you know, sort of like given, a, 
voice to that, those aspirations. And again, like I said, it's a South Asian vision, but with a, it's India-Pakistan specific. People say to us, well, why don't you include Bangladesh in it? And yes, Bangladesh is most welcome. Everybody is welcome. But Pakistan and Bangladesh don't have a problem. We are trying to work on the problem between India and Pakistan. And uh, you have, the, of course, the corporations getting into the act. Because uh, I, I don't know how many of you saw the Coke ad some months ago in May. So Coca-Cola did this thing. Um, it's called the Small World Machines. Did any of you come across it, Small World Machines? It was actually um, amazing. So they at, at a mall in Lahore. Um, uh, yeah, then we just, yeah. And then we'll go to the next one, which is making the rounds right now. Um, so the Co Coke did this thing a few, few months ago where they had at a mall in Lahore and a mall in Delhi, they had people in front of these machines where they could actually see each other and they could mirror each other's actions. And so that, and then, this ad that I'm going to show you now, this has gone viral over uh, YouTube. I don't know how, how many of you have come across this. Yes. Just wait, 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 wait. See, Adil, Adil, just wait. Yeah, just just go back. I just want to say something before I, I want to show. That. Yeah, how, how I just want to know how many of you have seen this. A few people have more than more than saw the Coke ad, but. Um, Interesting thing about this, again, it ties into that whole thing about the social media and, you know, like this is such an obvious idea. So of, uh, in, like, I think last year, some Pakistani, young Pakistanis made a video. I'm not going to show you that one because it's not as beautiful as this one. But the idea is there's a young man and he's talking to his grandfather. And the grandfather is also a young man, but he made him up with white hair and he's like, you know, talking. Did you see that? Any of you seen that? It's, it's, it's called respect. And this young man, sa the grandfather says, oh, I miss my old friend. And the young man says, oh, let me, you know, uh, and he said, I named his son. And so the, he, he, f he searches him on Facebook, and he finds him, and he contacts him via Skype. And he, he gets the grandfather face to face with the old friend via Skype. And it's a, what a point is that it's such an obvious idea now with this new media technology. And now Google last week launched this ad that we're just going to show which has received on YouTube over 4 million hits in one week. And it is not just Indians and Pakistanis who have been moved by it. There have been comments from people who speak no Urdu or Hindi. And there have been comments like, you don't need to speak the language to be moved by this. And this really encapsulates, A, the aspirations of the people, and B, the potential and the power of uh, technology that, uh, as I said, the corporations are uh, tapping into. So we'll just see this. It's three and a half minutes. ये मैं ये यूसुफ लंगोड़िया यार सी मेरा लाहौर में हमारे घर के सामने एक बड़ा बाग था उस बाग का गेट बाबा आजम के जमाने <laughs> रोज शाम को हमने वहां पतंगे उड़ानी और उसके बाद जाके यूसुफ के दुकान से जजरिया चुरा के खानी जजरिया और मेरा साहब नमस्ते मेरी पोती मुंबई वाली नमस्ते Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Um, Fuzzle Sweets? Hanji. Dada Jan, Delhi se kisi ki call hai. Hello? Yusuf Uncle? Kaun? Ji, mein Suman bol rahi ho Delhi se. Aapke bachpan ke dost Baldeer Ji ki poti. Yaad hai bachpan mein aap dono chajariya chura ke khate the. बचपन की तंग गली फिर से कूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी गांठ लेके बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था पार्टीशन के वक्त हम रातों रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए दादू यूसुफ जी 
बड़ी याद आती है कागजों के कश्तियों में डूब रहता था झांकती खिड़कियों में उलझा रहता था वो भी क्या दौर था मन पे न जोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था जी कौन हैप्पी बर्थडे यारा I know very few people who haven't got actually choked up watching this, and I know people who watched it multiple times and cried every single time, men and women, and not old people always. Either. Young so, people can also cry. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I just Thank want. You. So that's what I mean. That's the power of um, this new media. Thank you. Before we open up to the audience, I think you've sort of de facto answered it already, but I'll give you another chance to answer it. But let me ask a question to all three of you, as you look at the future, the 2060. what are the type of trends that you see in this area is it sort of stumbling along is it future positive is it things becoming worse things becoming better what is the trend that you see wait um once you have a book out you might as well use it as crutches all the time so there are, <laughs> there are actually some good chapters um uh, three or four in particular which talk about scenarios uh, and which we've uh, which have built actually the first chapter in the book um or, or the second one has three scenarios that's all it does to talk about where south asia can go um and you know it's the usual sort of positive negative and and business as usual one of them actually uh, is hell heaven and in between that's <laughs> correct that's that, correct that's those are the names of the yeah. three scenarios oh, hell yeah. heaven is yeah. using the islamic terminology for yeah. for those three um and i think it'll be fair to say that all of them conclude that if it's business as usual you're headed for hell yeah. um and and so it's a matter of deciding what 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 part of hell and how bad it's going to be but ultimately it's not looking good and so that's why i quoted uh, and there's the phrase which says that you've got to have a radical departure from the past as leaders of south asia to make things work is telling um and so by nature being a pessimist i'll stick to saying that we're headed in the wrong direction and i personally don't actually see the the drivers of that positive change setting in um you may have in fact if you look at south asia today it's very interesting there's some fascinating work going on by bina and others who are who are trying to to bring this uh, together in terms of the connectivity but if you look at the states there's an active effort at another level to get out of south asia it's been going on for a while but now virtually every success story that india and pakistan put out is saying that look we've managed this despite being uh, competitors and so i really don't see this this going in the right direction i'll come to uh, shaila but let's also collect these levers these possible pessimistic or not but sort of what are the possible levers of changing that path uh, ina of course has technology and good marketing uh, you did mention leadership uh, i'm assuming you mentioned gender equality and stuff but again do you see trend positive negative what are the possible levers of change difficult or not can i just add one here i i think one of the things that south asia can really benefit from is a conversation between however you define the state and the 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 crowd that bina is talking about and and so far i think these two sides are also seeing each other as competitors and 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 the state of course wins out most of the time uh, for all the wrong reasons but that conversation between the state and civil society quote and quote but the new civil society i think that could be a game changer 
Well, actually, it, it's interesting because I'm sitting between these two <laughs> uh, points of views that just presented us with a really completely different um, understanding of South Asia, and that is in the nature of South Asia being such a mosaic. And, and of course, I have not been working on South Asia for the past few weeks, uh, past few years. But looking back, looking at the book and reading uh, through our papers and listening here, uh, it seems to me that um, the civil society, parts of which come through the media and women who have done work in Barefoot College or um, various uh, activities like that, I think it is going to be uh, a combination of all these civil activities through civil societies that may actually force the state that is being so intra or has been so intractable eventually to respond, whether it's through media or through uh, education that these uh, barefoot college <coughs> women have created, or the Grameen type of bank, you know, the microfinancing, all that, I'm just thinking that it's not going to be a top-down uh, change. I'm just assuming or I'm just hoping that it'll be more the force of the civil society that would push the state to either collaborate, eventually, you know, like Aman Kiasa is putting pressure on the state to recognize the desire on the part of the people and to for, to proceed. So I, I think it is uneven, but I'm hopeful. Uh, one of the things I should note, because it's noted in the book by more than one author, and I think rightly so, is that when they use, or at least I use, and certainly many of the authors use civil society, it's not always civil. Uh, a lot of it is very uncivil, and social media is not very social. Uh, it, it actually isn't. It's, you know, it's the new place where you can shout at anyone because they don't see you. Uh, and so that too is a reality of that anger. One of the things that is talked about is there is a certain hope seething in South Asia, but there's also a certain anger seething in South Asia. Uh, and that's the volatile mix. You were going to say something in that. And I just wanted to come back to the um, conceptual framework we were trying to develop, this father-daughter relationship or the male caring. Just a few months ago, we heard about this horrible case of rape in, in India. And of course, that's not the first time, but that, was, that became very popular. So while our attention is focused on this horrible, violent act, at the same time, we forget how many men, brothers, sons, fathers, husbands, who were supportive, came in support of the women who had been the subject of such violent crime. So there's now a, an awareness, more conscious, uh, you know, consciousness on the part of men, in fact, to be uh, a vehicle of change, not so much uh, to be uncivil with a part of the uncivil society or civil society. But this, we, we want to, I, I, you know, we want to emphasize this, this whole idea of male caring, the, the you know, men and women relationship. That's what's going to push it forward. Future positive, Absolutely. stagnant. No, positive. Very positive. And I mean, yes, I, I'm, re I'm realistic. I know what the problems are. We all know what the problems are. And I agree with uh, Moid uh, in, his, in the reasons for his pessimism. But I think that um, what needs to be considered is how the states are moving toward. I mean, I think what's really important and what's really critical in this thing is the continuation of a democratic political process. And Moid referred to the past elections in Pakistan as much hyped. And I think rightly so. Um, hyped implies negatively. And maybe you want to say, OK, it, it, uh, it provides un unreasonable expectation. Then perhaps that's, that is the case. But that is the first step Pakistan has taken towards the democratic political process. And yes, of course, if you exclude people from that process, it's not going to work. But with each election, there is more and more inclusion. There will be more and more inclusion, and we've seen, and we, and it's there's no goalpost, no, there is no ideal society, no country in the world, no matter how strong its dem democracy, has everything right going about it. There will always be crime. There will always be violence against women. There will always be um, all kinds of uh, unsavory things going on. But uh, the the point is that there has to be accountability. Polit uh, public and political awareness, uh, um, steps taken by the state to uh, rectify those. And I think that this uh, public media that we are seeing now will do what Moid is saying is push the state. The people are pushing the state. We are seeing that 
the a lot of uh, steps being taken in I mean, I mean, in other countries too, but in South Asia we really have seen it, where um, actions, political actions, have been taken because of pressure by the social media, because of you know con people harping on on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, blogging and, and all of that. So where the newspapers are being circumspect and you know pussyfooting around issues or like trying to be responsible and not you know saying what needs to be said, the social people on the social media are going out and it, that's coming out in, and the public discourse that is being generated as a result of that tweeting and talking and Facebooking and all of that, I think, is creating a general pressure that governments can no longer ignore. Just a, one more point I want to make, um, uh, well, two points actually. One is about Bangladesh. I think Bangladesh has shown us the way um, because of its rulings against uh, the use of religion in politics. Um, the, that, that they have outlawed the use of religion in politics. No political party can campaign in the name of religion. And in Pakistan also, you're not allowed to use uh, poli uh, religious symbols in pol political campaigns, but yet they do use them. So again, it's a matter of that political process continuing. Remember that in Pakistan, we've not had that. It's been constantly interrupted by army rule. And in Pakistan, besides religion, that's the other elephant in the room is the intervention of military in politics all this time. And the, the second point I want to make is that about uncivil, in, incivility and uh, people being, uh, you know, social media being, being abusive and rude, absolutely. But I think, again, this is a new field, and I think it is up to the leaders in the field to set the ground rules and to say civility, uncivility will not be tolerated. The Aman Kiyasha Facebook group that we have, we constantly get people coming in um, who don't know how to interact in in a civil way, who don't know how to disagree. Do you, you remember Chalk? Uh, Chalk was a, the, the, a forerunner of all these, um, you know, online interactions between India and Pakistan um, about maybe 15 or 20 years ago. But it kind of folded up because there was too much uncivility. There were people coming in there and commenting in a really rude way, and there wasn't any moderation. So in the Aman Kiyasha Facebook group, we have a team of volunt and it's all voluntary. People are all, there are like 18 voluntary moderators uh, who are online. Somebody or the others are online all the time. Somebody is rude. They get, you know, uh, either they have to delete their comment, edit their comment, or they get kicked out of the group. So it becomes a safe place to have disagreements in a civil way. And that's really critical, I think. And that's something that we need to learn and we are learning. Let me open up to questions just to add my level of change, if you will, and point out that technology is greater than just the social media here. Um, it's ease of air travel, for example, uh, which has made massive differences within countries, certainly, not yet uh, amongst. But my favorite one was, I'm sure all of you joined me earlier this week in celebrating World Toilet Day. Um, Absolutely. That it was this week. Absolutely. Here is my all-time favorite fact of the week. There are more cell phones in South Asia than there are toilets. <laughs> this, this is huge. This is sad. This is, sad. This is yep. important. Sad. Yep. Right? It's one of the biggest health crises yes. there is. There are more cell phones in South Asia than there are uh, toilets. Right? So speak up for toilets. Yeah. One Absolutely. of the interesting things happening in India, for example, is the demand for toilets as dowry. So the slogan is, no toilet, no bride. That's, that's right? So you take a social habit which is not necessarily positive. And I saw this video last night. Case after case after case, the girl's family is saying, this is about dignity, this is about health, this is about my grandchildren. Build a toilet, bring, bring the wedding party after that. And so technology works its miracles in multiple ways. We'll take a few questions. Let's take, just collect a few so that we can keep our answers short. Um, uh, there's a microphone. Well, uh, I'm Ming from uh, International Relations. And this is really a great book and a wonderful panel. I'm learning a lot. Uh, I compare China and India, so I consider myself uh, across East Asia and uh, South Asia. And uh, my two questions and also perhaps comments uh, are from the East Asian perspective, and uh, the the, fir uh, the first is uh, related to the uh, the media or the human connections. Um, the c because in East Asia, I I I think a lot <laughs> between ch uh, mainland China, Taiwan, between North Korea and South Korea when the relation when the connection were just established and there was such a 
honeymoon period. And then after a, a period of these romance, then it's the societal or the civil society, people from both sides uh, started to really dislike each other and uh, um, uh, conflicts, uh, frictions began to emerge that needed the states actually to manage the, the conflicts. So uh, between mainland China and uh, Taiwan, um, their, is, their relationship started in 1980, but if I had to predict like in the 50 years, the societal level relationship perhaps will be worse than, than now, and now is worse than 20 years ago. Um, so, uh, but the, the government kind of worked out a way to manage the situation. So this leads to my second point, which is on the, uh, on the state. Um, when there are big issues, they call for leadership. But if it's a very weak government and a very weak state, absent crisis, how can leadership emerge? Uh, so uh, I'm uh, thinking about, uh, you know, do how about the officials in in, in these uh, states? Do they uh, are they the the best among the best talents in society? Uh, what about the education, recruitment, and the professional training after being in the in the in the government? So what what I'm asking is, are there projects to build up the state capacity? Let's take a few. Can good leaders come from bad states? was the question. Uh, Professor Asnath, who's actually one of our authors, and then Brenda, who's also one of our authors. My comment is directly on Dr. Muith Yusuf, and it is theoretical. Uh, uh, you Yusuf. might have noticed that during the last six months, you know, two major books on development has come out, one by Panagari and Jagdish Bhagavati, it is Development Matters, and another is by Amartya Shen and his students, Jean Trige, is that Uncertain Glory. Mm -hmm. And these are the two opposite in the poll, one is inclusive growth by same as usual and another age i will not say exclusive growth but it is directly the market oriented growth right and this week in new york review of books there is a good article by pankaj misra it is the some sort of compromise mm -hmm. between the two mm -hmm. do you have any comment okay Brent? and then we'll come come to you thank you i wanted to come back to the issues of weight of domination and gender violence that uh Shala was touching on and kick in another depressing, unfortunately, point that South Asia is at the top of this listing called the top most unsafe places in the world for women to live. That's a status of the world's women report. And the last report have Afghanistan, followed by India, followed by Pakistan in that order as the top most unsafe. Nashala and I, and it's a question really to all of you as leavers would say, okay, Let's look at activism and let's look at advocacy. Yes, India, where I headed up the UN for six years, has a great women-friendly constitution, ton loads of laws, poorly implemented, let's say, like probably everywhere. Justice Verma Commission on the heels of that horrific rape in December and others. So we see, say, the UN say no campaign to violence against women, to end violence against women, or Rutgers University, the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, but other other great approaches. And we want to advertise also the other gender <laughs> chapter in this great book, which is that of Anita Weiss, where she comes down to on education as her solution or lever, yeah. as uh, Adil's always after us for. Not rote learning, but rather critical thinking. And when we reached out to friends, feminist, uh, Philosopher Martha Nussbaum was the first to come back. Primary education for girls and critical thinking, promoting critical thinking. But we ask the room and all of you, are there other levers we should be turning to? Thank you. Yeah. Let, let's take a set of quick answers. We'll make them, we promise to make them quick and then we'll be able to squeeze in another. Anyone, any question, you don't have to take all, but whichever ones you, you, you fancy. Moid, state, weak state, uh, strong leader. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I, I think the whole sort of this concept of the state and leader, you have to sort of think about leaders not in a vacuum. I mean, they're also part of the society, and they, they reflect what comes out of that. So, so I think it's a bit of an oxymoron to say that you can do that. If you don't have meritocracy in a society, and much of South Asia is like that, it's difficult to pull up the, the right talent. But there's also another point which is quite often ignored, where people say, you oh, know, this leader is bad, and that leader is bad. I would argue that even if you put good people in a bad system, chances are that they will be corrupted before the system improves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think it works both ways. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make one general point on, on what the conversation has been here. 
as I see somebody who's not active in the social media, uh, what I see is these two sides thinking of themselves as opposites. And one saying, I'm going to fix the state because this beast is the problem. The other saying, what do these guys know? They're sitting there playing with technology. The conversation is missing. The conversation which says, I can help you improve without you losing votes. And the conversation that says, if you can help me do that, you're welcome to take this part of my sphere. I think that's the conversation South Asia needs if, if you want to sort of bring this as a win-win. Also on the Sen Das Gupta yeah. growth. Very quickly, I mean, this is, this is my personal, uh, personal view, not, not coming from the book. But to be honest, I think South Asia is a great example of what is wrong with our development model. If you can call a country the rising power in the world where half a billion people actually don't have food to eat, and if you can call a country an Asian tiger as Pakistan was in the 60s with 50 million people without uh, food and more today, that's exactly what's wrong. We've created success stories, started believing in them. You know, the shining India and it was the shining Pakistan and the rising this and the rising that. To the point where in, in one meeting, I mean, I, I wouldn't name the people, but in a policy meeting of South Asia, senior responsible of officials, I heard firsthand one official saying, you know, we've just figured out that the bottom 10% we can't deal with. So we're going to grow without them and then worry about them. That's what is wrong with the economic model. But they didn't say 47% though. <laughs> yes. Bina, uh, Shala, any, any other questions? Well, I, we don't take have, one more round? I don't really have any uh, responses to questions, and I'm glad that um, my friend uh, Brenda made those comments. But I'm just thinking of the question that was raised earlier on, and that is something along the lines that I was thinking, and I wanted to ask, you know, so it might not be the answer to the questions, but it perhaps forwards the question that was asked. Um, as I understood you correctly, you were talking about the mainland China and Taiwan, that people eventually became actually more separate from each other yes, than... Yes, the more interaction, the more friction that requires state managing the... That's right. The so the state was actually needed. frustrating the relationship. And I'm just wondering, um, in case of you know, South Asia and what you were talking about, I mean, following on what my um, lead was saying, uh, it seems to me that um, it is true, while there is this push on the part of the people, whether through media, uh, social media or other forms, for people to make the connections, to come together, but at the same time, there are all these other f uncivil forces that, and coming some of it from the state, that, that tries actually to push people away from each other, and eventually they may, it may become the norm rather than, um, you know, what the people might be hoping for. So, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have this answer, I, but I, I was don't, just... I don't... In India and Pak, the, the thing is that this region, South Asian region, is very interesting because, like I said, the people don't see each other as enemy, enemies. Even uh, when a Pakistani goes to Bangladesh, when I went to Bangladesh and we have fought, you know, the, the war and the Pakistan army was let loose upon then East Pakistan and they fought actually a war and India and Pakistan have actually fought wars. But when I go to, when I go to Bangladesh, when I meet Bengali friends, I don't feel like we are two enemies trying to meet, you know, we are not. <laughs> we are not. <laughs> and, and, and I think that the, that's the uh, same case with Indians. Uh, it's not, I think it might be a different case than, than uh, the, uh, the East Asian case because this has actually been an integrated region. There was the, the Grand Trunk Road stretching from Kabul to Calcutta that connected the entire North India. So the only part, you, you could say that all of that was connected through trade primarily for centuries, that whole thing. And what, okay, fine, you can say the South India and for the South, South uh, Sri Lanka might not be really part of that integration, but there's no hostility as such. I mean, there may be some hostility, they don't want to speak in Hindi, but I mean, they're not enemies. Um, I just wanted to make one point about, I think it's a very important point to remember that social media does not translate into political action necessarily. I mean, it can contribute to political action, but if, uh, if, if Facebook and Twitter were the benchmarks, then Imran Khan would have won the elections and Musharraf would be back in power by now instead of in the treason dock. 
Um, so, and, and similarly, I think that uh, we are looking at this big push uh, towards in India uh, for the electoral, you know, the, the, the rise of the BJP as a, as a political entity. Yes, it can may well be. But I'm going to just remind people here that after the attacks on Mumbai uh, on 26 November um, 2008, 2008 uh, BJP, you know, again mounted this campaign against Pakistan and Muslims. Uh, and there were state elections coming up and the general elections afterwards, it did not win any of them. And I don't know whether that will be different this time or not, but I think that those who are predicting a BJP and a Modi win based on social media might find, you know, it's not so simple. Let me take a last round of questions, but let me also add, uh, because this is important. Uh, well, first, th this is not the first of our such panels. We held the first uh, sort of launch panel, if you will, in Pakistan in August. We'll have the next one in Nepal in January, and we're planning one more in Singapore uh, later this year. But one thing that came at the previous panel, which I'm also sensing here, and we need to be cognizant, especially because sort of there's a um, sort of country mix on the on the stage right now, is that there is South Asia beyond India, Pakistan, and even Bangladesh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And if you are a Nepali or a Sri Lankan or a Bhutanese or a from Mauritius. The South Asian conversation can get very wrapped in India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. and throw in a little sort of sprinkling yeah. of Bangladesh. Now, those are three giants, just in population numbers. There's a billion plus Indian. There's nearly 200 Bangladeshis, nearly 200 uh, Pakistanis. But in the emergence of a region, the region itself sometimes forgets that. And one of the things that came at the previous panel, I thought, because it was mostly ambassadors talking about geopolitics, is there is a world outside South Asia that affects South Asia. There is the China. Uh, there is the East Asia. You know, Singapore, for example, you go to Singapore universities and there you find lots of South Asians. Uh, you go to Africa and you find lots of South Asian. You go to Suriname and everyone is a South Asian, right? It's a Caribbean non-island in Latin America. Speaks Dutch, entirely South Asian. So there is a South Asia beyond South Asia. And as Moid also pointed out, we can get wrapped in this India-Pakistan-ness of it, as if our sort of petty little thing is all that drives the region. But on that happy thought, we'll take a few questions and then wrap up. Yes, sir, and then here. Thank you. Uh, because of the biases that I come from, and I don't believe I have an objective bone in my body, um, I consider myself a child of privilege, not because of any financial assets I have, but because uh, of my education, because of my genetics and my DNA, by merit in four cities and three countries. Um, my first 19 years was spent in India, eight years in North India, less 13 in South India where I did my undergraduate. My working life started in Karachi, Pakistan in 1960. And I've been in all my years in USA, I've been in Cambridge, Mass. And I consider myself 0.1% of the privileged people in the world because being here. And today, I have my hopes for academia have been heartened by Moid's views. I never in my family or in peer groups or in academia or in the city of Cambridge where there is such la pressure on land because international organizations want to be next to MIT. Do people ever consider themselves to be privileged? And we are totally privileged. And they're in family thing, you know, we, when you talk about civil society, what socioeconomic class are we talking about? We are talking of ourselves. We are so incestuous. We are so narcissistic about the people that we are in academia the large portion of people in India and Pakistan have nothing. There's nothing has changed since I was bewildered as an eight-year-old as to why people talk the good talk but never followed up with actions. And my being 33 years in Cambridge, Mass, I'm totally, absolutely disappointed in academia. I don't know why academia should be above the, the masses in not realizing that whenever academia talks, academia talks of privilege of themselves, of more is ego of academia than anything that's discussed. And so, you know, you have revived my hopes in academia. Thank we you. Have, we have, we'll keep working at it, sir. 
uh, <laughs> right here. <laughs> to do, no, the getting the whole back, getting the whole back, getting the whole back. Um, I don't know if this works, but um, my name is Chen Xi. I'm a film student here at BU, um, and I have a question for Professor Shala. Um, it's more like an in individual take. I know I have some friends who are entrepreneurs in uh, Pakistan, like the girls. Um, they're doing like empowering women, that kind of things, like sugar and bliss. So I wonder what is your opinion on entrepreneurship in um, solving these problems, this is the social problems. Like, what do you think about their take? Are they eradicating the root causes? You know how how effective that is. Can I? Sh should I respond? Please. Um, well. Thank you very much. I think, um, I mean, uh, I can think about entrepreneurship on two levels. One is on the very act itself, which I think it's very creative, it's very interesting, depending upon, of course, what you do, then it could have <coughs> good results. I sort of missed on what exactly these entrepreneurial groups do in Pakistan. What was it that they're doing? Um, I, I think for the, uh, a group, uh, an organization called Bliss is they have the Pakistani <coughs> The woman community have them to you know do embroideries and teach them to do the embroideries and put in the handbags ah. and you know combine oh. into the fashion right. industry. Mm -hmm. Without it, and, and yeah. well, you see, I mean, there are quite a few um, organizations like that in Pakistan. In fact, that is what it, uh, initially caught my attention when I first went to Pakistan. I was on my way to India. I wasn't going to stay in Pakistan, and when I saw the women there. And what they were involved, you know, the APWA from the very beginning, um, WAF, um, uh, um, what is the Nagar's uh, organization? ORET. There were quite a few of them, and they're quite active, very involved. In fact, that's what made me change the topic of my uh, research from working on fundamentalism and religious development to women's involvement, you know, the educated uh, middle class, upper middle class women who are involved in their own countries. And I very much agree with the fact that poverty is a most horrible situation in South Africa, I mean South India. I had never seen anything like that. So many of these women who are involved, Kishra Nahid, which is one of the most important poets in Pakistan, had in fact an organization in Yakigate in the old city trying to teach embroidery. I mean, even teach women to sign their names so that they are not being fooled out of their own property or anything like that. So I think these organizations are very important. And in fact, that is one of the factors I mentioned that I see eventually these such organizations would be able to come together, the, you know, the accumulations of that, the force of all of them together might move the society. Oh. Wrap this up if I can add a word to this also related to what Brenda said about education in the true sense. We have a chapter in the book by uh, Jamshed Marker, uh, who was, uh, uh, Jamshed, sorry, Marucha. Jamshed Marucha, who was then provost of Tufts, is now president of the Cooper Union uh, in New York. Uh, but in some ways, I think if something is missing, is more on education. What would, you know, there enough chapters there, but if I would have added, and one of the reasons is what you said, uh, this is my own research and other people way back, <coughs> all across South Asia, five years of education for the girl child. Five years of education for the girl child brings down the TFR by one. TFR is total fertility rate, the number of pregnancies a healthy woman will go through in her life. So one TFR less, one pregnancy less is huge. Mm -hmm. Here's the magic. Five years of education bring it down by one, Four years does not bring it down by 0.8. Six years doesn't bring it down by 1.2. The magic happens at five, then it happens at about eight years of education, then it happens about 12 years of education. So what's happening at five? What's happening at five, in all probability, is reading, writing, arithmetic. Right? That's about the education you need to be able to read, mm -hmm. write, follow your kids' schooling, which means that is the about the amount of education that makes you a real decision maker in the home. The structure of the household changes if the girl child, now the mother, has reading, writing, arithmetic. So thinking about education as that lever and motor of change in a more profound sort of way uh, is particularly important. And, and those numbers for most of South Asia are, in fact, uh, uh, um, improving. As we wrap up, maybe a one word, but certainly no more than one sentence answer, and then, then my, my duty to thank all of you. But if we are in 2060, fast forward, are we still talking about a South Asia? Or are we saying, yeah, that was a good idea, right? <laughs> As the editor of the book, of course, we'll be talking about it. <laughs> <laughs>
person who fell in love with South Asia, I do hope that it continues, yeah. Yeah, there'll be a South Asian Union. <laughs> as, as someone who serves on the board of something called the South Asia University, which is an idea that there, will, will, there is more. Uh, but also one, someone said in our last panel, which I thought was very, very interesting, that um, South Asia cannot rise without South Asia. Mm. He was talking about China and, 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 and India, and the argument was that China may rise without the rest of Asia rising. But India cannot rise without the rest of mm. South Asia rising. I do not know if that is true or not, but I wish and pray that all of South Asia rises. I wish and pray all of humanity rises. Thank you very much to our panel. And